Good morning, everyone. Pete Pardo here from CA Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of What's Hot with CA Tranquility in the co-captain's chair today. Mr. Stephen Reed, all the way from Scotland via the Zoom. Good morning, my friend. How are you this morning? Good evening here. I am, I am well here. Yes. <laughs> all good. <laughs> the wonders of technology. The time difference between us is huge. <laughs> <laughs> So we've got uh, a selection of uh, new releases here that we wanted to talk about. And, uh, you know, we'll touch on all of them briefly just to give you guys nice flavors of some things. I'm going to let Steven kick off with uh, two of his, and then I'll do a couple. We'll kind of ping pong back and forth. Right, okay. Well, I'm going to start with a band called Magenta. Okay, I don't know what sort of profile they've got elsewhere. So this is their brand new album, Masters of Illusion. I've had this for a few weeks now. Um, it's a slow grower, but man oh man is this a good album. Um, Master of Illusion is, there's six songs on Masters of Illusion, okay, and each song is about a horror actor from the 50s and 60s, okay, so from the classic Silver Screen kind of thing. Um, but it's actually about the actor as opposed to the parts they played and various things like that. There's quite some nice lyrical twists and turns on it. Um, it's a very beautiful package, I have to say. Another double disc CD DVD. And released simultaneously was a very limited kind of remix disc. Okay, so this is the Lost Reels, is what it is. So there's six tracks on this, three of which are over 10 minutes long. I think we're heading towards 16, 17, 18 minutes for a couple of them. So you've still got an hour's plus worth of music on that. I think 73 minutes worth of music on this. I've only just listened to this today because I've been a little bit obsessed by this, to be honest with you, that I haven't moved on to this. I thought this would be a bit second best because it is five of the six remastered or remixed different versions and four of the band's older songs updated for 2020. Wow, this is great too. So <laughs> then you, can get, you can buy them together as a bit of a package or you can buy them separately, but they're just great, I would say, English prog, much more prog than they have been of late. The last album that they released was a little bit more contemporary and the idea here was to kind of get the Moogs back out, get the Mellotrons back out, there's a lot of 12 string guitar on here. They have never shied away from Magenta. Uh, Rob Reed is their main uh, songwriter and they've never shied away from the fact that they like progressive rock and they, could, they don't mind sounding a little bit like Yes you know, mine sounding a little bit like Kansas in places, just touches here and there. Yes, is a real touching point on this. The album closes with a title track, which is the one that I think is the longest. There's an awful lot of bass lines and, and kind of guitar sounds that you'll immediately go, hmm, yes. Okay, so that kind of tells you where we're at. However, they do have a female vocalist, so that's Christina Boo. I think she's marvellous. I will add a little bit of a warning there that when I put this album on when my other half is in the house, so when Vicky's in the house, she really doesn't like the natural vibrato that's in Christina's voice. It's very obvious. It is a little in your face. I love it, I have to say, because it's not forced. It is in there. I have to say that Vicky really doesn't. And I mean, really doesn't, okay? So that may be a factor for some people, I have to say. But to me, the one the the... I think the most striking aspects of this album, and also this for what could be viewed as a little bit of a throwaway, is just how good they sound. Rob Reed has produced them himself. Wow, they sound stunning. The atmosphere that's created certainly tells a story, takes you to where they, I think, intend you to go. And it's just a really, really good album, I have to say. I've always liked them. Never quite really got the, the massive fuss around them because there has been in recent times. Yeah, they, and they've been around forever. I mean, I remember listening to yeah. them in what, like the late nineties, early two thousands. I mean, it's, you, you know. yeah, that that would be right at the very start. Would be late nineties, yeah. early two thousands. And I'll be honest and say that I don't have much magenta in, in the collection because I've heard a lot. I've got a lot of friends who really like them, and I've always liked that. And it's been a little bit too tame for me a little bit, I would say. You know, there's this kind of folky elements in a lot of their stuff. And as I say, they've never shied away from where the sound comes from and, and, and what they like and, and why they, they're making the music that they are. And that's maybe been a slight turn off for me in places, to be honest. Th this clicks in a way I had not anticipated. I bought it on a bit of a whim. I must admit, I bought it during lockdown. It was one of those pre-orders that came through. 
I couldn't help but spend some money on some music. So <laughs> I went through the list and kind of thought, well, I won't. Uh, and I thought, well, you know what, it was the two together. You were getting a little bit of a special price. There's a DVD that's got surround sound mixes and, you know, videos on it and things. And I thought, do you know what, you know, we'll, we'll give it a go. And I love it. I have to say it's really good. It's one of the best things that I've heard this year, I would say. Didn't Im immediately hit me like that. I liked it right off the bat. It's grown into something really kind of special, to be honest with you. And as I say, it's not often that you get a little companion disc that you don't kind of think, yeah, it's nice, but I'll never listen to it very often. This is a really good album in its own right, I have to say. And yes, five of the songs are already on this, but they are different enough. The atmosphere is different enough. And this sounds a lot drier. This, this is quite not grandiose. They're not a grandiose band. They're not big and bombastic. But the sound is very atmospheric. It's quite heady in places, it has to be said. I think it's a very involving album. Whereas this is quite dry. And, and it, I think it you know, attaches to you in a different way. And together they make a really good companion, I have to say. So that, that's Magenta. And that is Masters of Illusion with The Lost Reel. You don't have to have them both, but I personally do and would like you to. <laughs> I think you should. Dead impressive. Pretty cool. I'm, I'm glad to hear they're still making music because, like I said, they, they were releasing all sorts of stuff like back. It's been a while. I haven't listened to them in a while. I, I know I have a few Magenta albums laying around. Yeah. So, um, yeah. They're one of those bands that I think they've been in the go now for, I think, just over 20 years. And they must have, including like download exclusives and various things, I think they've got maybe 10, 12 albums. That's a lot in that time. Yeah. Maybe too much, arguably, and I understand that the logistics are trying to keep a band going these days. So you've you got to be out there, you've got to be in everyone's face, and you've got to you know, keep the fans engaged, shall we say, to keep a band viable. But sometimes I think as a fan, sometimes you go, that's a bit too much of that. Yeah. I, you know? So, and, you know, they came at a time, too, where there were a lot of bands coming out of the UK who were doing this kind of neo-progressive thing, right? So you had, uh, yeah. you know, which kind of followed in the wake of Marillion and IQ, so on and so forth. So you had those guys, mostly Autumn, Iona, and the, the list goes on and on, and Galahad. I mean, there's so many bands. And I think that uh, Magenta kind of got lost in the shuffle a little bit there for a while, but that sounds like a good yeah. one. So I mean, maybe a little bit later than, than, than most of that. But the, I mean, there has been a resurgence over here, bands like Big Big Train, Tiger Moth Tales, who've all started to come through and really make a bit of an impact now, and they're starting to make an impact on a, a wider scale. The prog scene here, certainly, is really quite busy now. Do you know that there's, there's quite a lot on the go, but a lot of it's very, very good, I have to say. And that's not always the case when it seems as, as busy as that. I was, obviously, we're, we're, all, we're verging on vibrant, is what we're verging on now, which, which is a good thing, obviously. It's just a shame that they can't pack out venues. That would be that would be the kicker. That's what would take it over the top and, and make it into a movement, but not so easy these days, it has to be no. said. But yes, no. lots, lots of great music to explore. If you like the Magenta album, you like that sort of thing, there's a whole load of offshoots and things. They're all in different bands and different little projects. And I mean, there's guys like John Mitchell from, you know, It Bites and Arena and various things. He's a wee guest on this. Uh, um, uh, Troy Dunockley, who plays Pipes and various things in Nightwish, but he's he's on more albums a year than I think anybody else in the world <laughs> doing a little blow on the pipes here and there. So yeah. he's on that as well. So there's a few names that'll click with, with, with people that, that might draw them to that as well that, that wouldn't always. Yeah, cool. cool. So that's my first one. What will I do for my second one then? Okay, I'll go to, I'll go for a reissue next then, is what I'll go for, okay? So this is from 2016 initially. This is a bit dark to see here, okay? This is Gandalf's Fist, okay? So this is the Clockwork Fable. Now, anyone who, you know, reads the Sea of Tranquility site and, and is, you know, had a look at some of my reviews, if they remember, this was my album of 2016. This to me was just a, quite an achievement, to be honest with you. This is a, a triple disc album, triple CD album, okay? That is probably wider than my screen here, all right? Really great looking thing. And it was, it's a play, I think it's a radio play that's set to some fantastic prog, is what it is. And to me, they've perfectly married the two. If you want a concept album that's a story, this is it. If you want a progressive rock album that's a great progressive rock album, this is it. If you want a radio play, this is it. If you want to laugh out loud a little bit, this is it. Because there's a lot of quirky, and I would say English humour in here. 
to know there's steampunk cake launchers and there's a lot of badgers involved in various things like that. Maybe a bit niche and all that sort of way, but the whole way it's presented is fantastic. Now, the question I asked when I reviewed that four years ago was, where would you go from there? Well, they went for the clockwork prologue was what they went for. So to, they went back and did very Star Wars. They did some prequels is what they did. So, okay. And like Star Wars, they weren't quite as good, not like Star Wars. They were still very good, right? So another beautiful package and all that sort of thing. And I still wondered at the end of that, where would they go from there? And I don't think they know. And the reason I don't think they know is what they've done now is they have reissued the Clockwork Fable as a five vinyl box set. Okay, yeah, five. Absolutely. Yeah, five. Because there's three CDs to squeeze on here and they haven't compromised, they haven't edited it down, they haven't changed the story. It's just a stunning thing. It's beautiful. And it's, as I say, it's a steam work, a, a steampunk work is what this is. And if anything deserves to be on an antiquated format, I mean, they actually released it on wax disc when they first released it. You know, the round ones that you would put in an old player. Sure. A nice gimmick. It sold out, believe it or not. They maybe only made three, I don't know. Uh, but it did sell out. And But to me, this is a sort of album that deserves to be on vinyl, and it's just a thing of absolute beauty, I have to say. Um, I like the cover on that a lot. Yeah, it's black vinyl, and then you get a little inlay that's got some more artwork, and then a full cast list. So your cast list involves Blaze Bailey, it involves Ian Lucasen, um, but you've also got actors who, especially if you're in the UK, to be fair, guys like Mark Benton, who is in probably making his name, I think, called Shakespeare and Hathaway, which is a bit of throwaway lunchtime detective show, but he's very good in it. Um, he's been in a couple of great comedy things, um, but you've also got actors in, who are voicing on this who've been main players in like Downton Abbey, Doctor Who. These are real guys that, that do this sort of stuff for a living, and that's the difference, as it shows through. These are not just guys reading parts. These are guys playing roles, and it runs through the music in such a way that... To me personally, and I know a lot of people are not so sure about lots of talky albums, but to me, it's not an album that has some music, then it stops and talks, and then has some music, then it stops and talks. It flows together beautifully, and I couldn't resist, although I've already got the fancy three CD thing, and then the prologue. And I'm not sure if this came only came with a promo, which was a, which I got many moons ago. It was actually, I think, just a, a CDR. But they've, they've gone to, to, to the lengths of giving a tour guide of Cogtopolis. So the story is set underground, okay? The human race has ruined the planet, as you would expect. So they've moved underground, and really the story is about trying to break free from the shackles of should they be able to go back up onto the Earth? Are they being kept underground for a reason? So you have, you have maps, okay? And I'm a sucker for this sort of stuff, you know? I do like <laughs> one set. You have a lot of character synopsis, and it's all done with a pinch of salt. I mean, I know it looks, it looks like it's been taken really, really seriously. They do, because this is beautifully put together, and they really don't. They know that they're having a little bit of a giggle at the same time, and I quite like that. It's not mega serious. They don't, they don't think that they've you know, created some you know, Shakespearean classic, but at the same time, they have created a really great story and set it to some phenomenal music, and they're a kind of underground progressive band who I really think whether a three CD concept radio play is the way to make your name, arguably not, to be honest with you. But I suppose if you know that you're never going to be superstars, go and do what you want to do. And this was clearly what they wanted to do because it's been executed so well. So there's only 300 of the vinyl box sets, okay? So there's 299 left because I've got one here, right? <laughs> so I know it's not sold out because I did check this yesterday to make sure I wasn't in the way to talk about something that has already gone. So it's still available on their website. How many are left? Now that I don't know. It's not been out for long, but if that, if that appeals to you, and it's also quite reasonably priced, depending on shipping for parts of the world and various things, I suppose, but it's a great thing. And I love it to bits, as you can tell. So there you go. So that's my first two. Well, you know, quite frankly, for genre fans, you know, prog rock fans, that's the kind of stuff that everybody loves, right? So well, I, I think <laughs> they're, they're, they're pushing that on the right audience, right? So. <laughs> yeah, also, anyway. <laughs> exactly, exactly. 
All right, I'm going to go to Norway here for uh, a band that's been around for like 15 years. And I'll be honest with you, I really haven't had much exposure to these guys. It's uh, Arabs and Aspic. Madness and Magic oh. is their, uh, their brand new album. And this is on Charisma Records. Mm -hmm. Really good progressive band. They've got like, I mean, you know, if you, if you knew nothing about these guys and you put this on, you'd probably say, Pete, that sounds like something that was probably recorded in like 72 or something like that. Right. Okay. They fully understand and have captured like the classic prog rock era. Most notably, you're going to hear some like Van de Graaff generator. The vocals sound okay. a lot like Peter Hamill, the music, mm -hmm. uh, little bits of King Crimson, some Eloy, that sort of thing. Very, very yeah. uh, classic sounding, you know, long tracks for the most part. Uh, like Heaven is in Your Eyes is the final track. It's like nearly 17 minutes long. It starts off with uh, I Wow to Thee, My Screen, which is almost nine. Got a couple shorter pieces in the middle, but uh, a couple multi-part tracks, quite good. Lots of, you know, Hammond organ, uh, heavy bluesy guitar riffs. Like I said, the really good emotional, but like, you know, angry vocals at times, you know, angry like in a Peter Hamill sort of way. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Just really good classic sounding stuff. I, I was amazed when I went and did some research that these guys have like a, like a ton of albums. I mean, they, they yeah, release like I've albums almost two, every year. Yeah, I've heard two of the older ones. Haven't heard this yet. I need to rectify that because not knowing what each other was doing, which I quite like to be fair. I can't remember the names. I think I've heard possibly not the one before that, but the two prior. And they are, they are just steeped in that sound, aren't they? That, as you say, other than the fact the production is absolutely fantastic on, on the couple that I've heard, you could confuse them for actually a band that are releasing old albums from that either. And that's yeah, quite great. They, they, yeah, they've got that feel. I mean, and there's a couple tunes on here that have like that kind of Canterbury sound to it, a little kind of yes. quirky, almost jazzy in spots, right? And uh, and then, yep. then they, it's got the heavy passages and I quite like it. I mean, I think it's really good. I definitely want to, you know, investigate some of their other catalog and, uh, you know, the cover, cover art, the back cover art, pretty cool as well. Yeah. So I dig it. Arabs in Aspic. Not too bad. Yep. So that's my Fine. first. Fine. Yeah. So my uh, my next one is from uh, an old favorite of mine. And this this actually came out in late 2019. So I'm a little bit late in getting to this, but better late than never, I always say, right? So this is a Toto, old as new. So this is basically a collection of rarities and leftover tracks that didn't make certain albums and what have you that they made available in their all in box set, which came out a couple of years ago as a like right. bonus disc of stuff you're not going to get anywhere else. And at the time you had to buy the box set to get this. And I know a lot of okay. Toto fans were like, I really don't need the rest of that stuff that's in that box set, but I really want this. <laughs> so then for all those folks who spent all that money to get that box set, lo and behold, like not even a year later, now this thing is available all on its own. I, I'm, I'm judging you did not that, right? Not even a year later. Not even, did right? Not? Oh, wow. That helps. That helps. Because I've, I've been that guy. I've well, we've all done it. We've all done Special editions for, for, for an album or sometimes two songs or whatever it may be and you think you know it's worth that <clears throat> amount of money you know and then they go and release it on something else so yeah okay i'm not a fan of that <laughs> in that sense <laughs> however as someone that didn't buy the total box set i am going to buy this <laughs> yeah well so, i didn't buy it either quite, quite frankly i didn't even know the box set was out and then uh, i was I don't know. I, I was looking, uh, it may have been when I was doing like the ranking the albums by them or something like that. I went into their Wikipedia page and I see this, uh, this listing for something called old is new as the, their final release. I'm like, what is that? I never heard of that before. So I did a little research and like, Oh yeah, that's only available on the all in box set, but you, you got to buy the whole thing. And I'm like, then I looked yep. at the price and I'm like, well, I don't need anything else on that. And I looked at the price. So I was like, Whoa, I certainly yeah. don't need that box. set. I guess I'm never going to hear this again. And then like a few months later, all of a sudden I see this is listed as their new release and it's all on its own, available on its own. And I'm thinking, boy, all those total fans must be pretty pissed off. They went out and bought that box set just to get this. And now they got this yeah. box that they don't, I mean, you know, whatever, but. Um, let's, let's be kind to Toto and say that's questionable label tactics. Will we? Yeah. 
but they're not the first one. They're not the first, and they won't be the last to do it. So, no and, maybe, and this is probably it's probably the label that did this too. So, this is a legacy thing. So, uh, yeah. but you know what? Some really good stuff on here. Uh, a good mix of uh, you know songs from throughout uh, portions of their catalog. You know, most of what's on here is like the last like 20, 25 years. But there's some other stuff on here as well. A uh, good mix of the poppy stuff. The the you know the more there's a couple of rockers on here. A couple of things that touch on you know a little bit of that proggy jazz fusion thing that they touch on every now and then but i would say really good half of it's exceptional the other half is okay i mean it's it is what it is right it's a collection of rarities this is not a four or five star reviewed album i think i gave this like three and a half um plenty to recommend on here and i think if you're a uh, if you're a fan you gotta have it right i mean i got everything they've, they've ever done so um is there a mix of singles on it then yeah, uh, I'm trying to think exactly. I, I believe. Sorry, on this board, yeah. yeah, I'm trying to remember exactly uh, who sings on this. So you've got uh, Joseph Williams, yeah. Lukather, Joseph Williams. Yeah, so but it's even David just Page. The Lewis, obviously. Yeah, yeah, it's, so it's going to be. Probably yeah. played a period of time as well, then. Yeah, so, you know, yeah, you're not going to get. Uh, Bobby Caldwell on here. So it's it's mostly Williams, Luca Third and Page is, is on here. Right. Okay. Which yeah. is okay by me. I mean, you know, that's that's yeah, it works for me. I, I mean I, I, there have been a few exceptions along the way in more re well, more recent years. I haven't done all that much in recent years to be fair. But some of the recent stuff was a bit mm. I c I don't mind the recent stuff to be fair. A lot of fans are, are not keen, but there have been some bumps along the road, it has to be said, with with, with Toto, unfortunately, in recent years. We we do like to remind people as best we can that a lot of the classic bands are still making classic stuff. Toto haven't always, to be fair. What I will say, to go slightly off on a tangent, is they played Scotland oh, now, maybe five years ago, maybe a little longer ago. And unbelievably, that was their first time in Scotland. Okay, wow. for a band that's been on the go that long, and have had hits over here. Do you know, they, they, they were a big chart back in the 80s, as you would expect. That was their first time playing in Scotland. And I've seen a lot of bands over the years, and I'm not convinced I've ever seen a band who opened with something I think quite new be utterly blown away by the reception that they received from an audience as they were in Glasgow. It was a proper hairs on the back of the neck moment. And I mean, they actually, I think they were like due to go straight into something else, but they actually stopped and looked at each other. And it was just one of those moments, it was one of those, those gigs you walked away from going, I was there, that was special, you there know? You so, so anyway, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, uh, yeah. they've, uh, you know, since like the 90s started, I mean, they've, they've got a handful of albums and I would think like uh, Kingdom of Desire and Falling In Between are both pretty spectacular. There's another one or like, you know, Minefields, I'm not a big fan of. Um, I'm not a big fan of Minefields. I like to, I can't remember the, the, the most recent all new studio album. Oh, that was uh, what eleven or twelve or thirteen, whatever it was called, whatever yeah. the number fourteen. Yeah, that, I, that's I very that. good. Yeah, that's very. Yeah, good. I really like that. It maybe didn't quite capture the classic Toto sound. It was maybe it's a little rocking though. Yeah, it's pretty rocking. Yeah, I, I loved it. I have to say, I really, really liked it. I have to say, yeah. but it didn't wasn't received massively well by the whole fan base. But that's the way of things, to be fair. But yeah, I thought it was really right. good. Do you know? That's right. All right, you're up next. So, right, okay, what have we got? We've got a band called, I haven't reviewed this yet on the site, but I will be very soon. This is Blind Ego. I'm picking very dark album covers here, okay? So, <laughs> Blind Ego is the side project of Carla Valner, okay? So, he's the guitarist in RPWL, okay? So, great German prog band, or as my daughter will call them, Roppel, okay? So that's what they become in, in this house. And they're... I would say a very European prog band. They've got that kind of smooth, mellow, laid back sound. They're not as challenging as a band to say like Riverside. They're not gonna, you know, they're not threatening in any way, but they make some lovely melodic, you know, prog. They, they came from a, I don't think they like to be reminded of it too much, but a Pink Floyd tribute act was how they started off. And they have kind of touched on that again over the years. I think they released an album of Pink Floyd live material. So they're obviously not that ashamed of it, obviously. Um, but this is now Blind Eagles fourth album so not bad for a side project to be fair um and this is the first one i would say that hasn't got kind of star names previous albums have had guys like we'll mention them again john mitchell and clive nolan so that's two guys from arena you're involved in pen dragon and it bites in there 
uh, John Jowett. So we're also in arena there. He's been in a whole lot of different progressive things like Jadis and things like that. Oh, yeah. Uh, Yogi Lang, the singer of RPWL. So these guys have all, Igor Cavalera, believe it or not, they, these have all have been guests on previous albums. There's not a big name on this one. Um, and I think it's better for it, personally. Now, fans of his main band may be a little confused by Blind Eagle because there's a bit of prog metal about them, but I would say that they're, they're beginning to veer more into being a hard rock band now, and they're doing it very well. I think Valnor is enjoying the opportunity to, to rock out. There's some great riffs on here. The second song, especially, so Preaching to the Choir, which is the, the title track of the album, that's got some real bite to it. Um, and some of the slower stuff um, is really good. The singer, who is called, let me look here, Scott Balaban, has a little bit of Miles Kennedy about him. So when they slow things down and they kind of, you know, add a little bit more restraint to what's going on, there is an Alter Bridge sort of, sort of feel, which I really hadn't expected from this. I've heard like, another two of their albums before. I really liked them, but you could kind of tell it was coming from a progressive rock background. You can't really with this. I have to say. So a little bit of a surprise, and, I, and this has been in the car in the last, last couple of days, and I, I, I kind of meant to change it and haven't because I've been really enjoying it, I have to say. So that, that's a, been a surprise for me in this, the terms of what it does. Not the fact that it's good, but more in the terms of, of what it does. So a little bit of prog metal, a little bit of prog, but more a kind of heavier straight ahead rock album. So whether it will cross over to the fan base, I'm not sure. But worth the go for a wider audience too, I would say, to be honest. Um, and that takes me to another reissue. So this is Toby and the Whole Truth. Okay, so I don't know if Toby Jepson is, is a big name beyond the UK. Oh, it's Toby Jepson, okay, yeah. Yeah, so Little Angels, <laughs> Wave of Sons. This was his, well, let me get this right, 1995 solo album. Okay, so this was what he did after Little Angels. Um, I on the site if you want to have a search for the interviews on the site I did a very long very long interview with Toby Jepson um, where we really covered his whole career I'm a massive Little Angels fan always have been kind of picked him up very early on the early EPs and various things like that saw them live with I think they supported Cinderella at one point they supported Marillion which was a very strange mix but I like both so it worked for me but very odd mix and I've just followed them all the way through. And this was a very misunderstood album at the time. He was coming out of what could be construed as a good time rock band. You know, they had a number one album in the UK, but still couldn't make enough money to pay off their debts with the label. They split up and Toby Jepson still can't tell you why. He still doesn't really know why they split up. They just kind of agreed not to do it anymore. And then they stopped and he thought, well, what do I do now? So he got the offer to make a solo album and he made a very honest solo album. It still sounds like the guy that wrote for Little Angels, but it doesn't sound like that band. You can hear his hooks, you can hear his vocals. Sounds like his guitar playing, but the songs on here, I mean, the song titles tell you where he was in his life. So we've got some people are more equal than others, better off without me. Uh, the strength, they haven't got the strength to carry on. The wind blows hard. I mean, I'm only in the first five song titles here, do you know? So he wasn't in a good place, but what it makes is, is quite a grown up melodic rock album, which I think was very much underappreciated at the time, even by the Little Angels fans. The release date got mixed up, so people were going out looking for it before it was out. But then, then by the time it came out, he got pneumonia on the tour, so he couldn't promote it. And things just kind of fell apart after that, to be honest with you. And he kind of flitted in and out. He ended up being a film extra. He was in Gladiator and, and various different massive films, but you probably can't see him anywhere, do you know? <laughs> Met Steven Spielberg and all these various things. He's got some amazing stories to tell. Um, the interview's well worth a read if, you, if you're vaguely interested in Little Angels, Toby Jefferson, or just that era of, you know, melodic rock. But this is a really, really good album, and this is only just out. This arrived just a couple of days ago here. There's two bonus tracks, which are exclusive to this, which fit with the sound and, and the time of the album, and they're very good. This is limited. This is number 146 of 550, but it is still available. And it's a very nice, you know, there's a little synopsis at the start of, you know, where he was at, at the time personally and how the album came to be. And then there's new illustrations and lyrics all the way through. And the actual album is 
popped in at the back here, you know, really nice, well thought through. It's a genuine book as opposed to one of these, you know, wallets that you get. But it's just one of those albums that slipped through the cracks for a variety of different reasons um, and probably just missed the target market at the time. But considering we are going back 25 years, well, I'm obviously therefore 25 years older, and it resonates in a way with me now and has done for maybe the last five, 10 years that it definitely didn't at the time, to be fair. I've got the original CD of this as well because I bought everything that they went and did afterwards. And not, not one of Little Angels made any music that sounded like Little Angels, which at the time disappointed me because that's what I wanted. <laughs> now, now I'm a little, little bit more mature. Oh, and probably not. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully, so, anyway. Yeah, well, that's the theory. <laughs> um, so, like Bruce Dickinson, the guitarist, he went and, and with his brother and did a band called Blow, which tells you an awful lot about what the sound was like. Okay. <laughs> at the time, I was like, where are the hips? Do you know, where's the choruses? Now I look at it and go, oh, okay. So, you kind of like 60s, 70s rock and, you know, you like some classic stuff. A little bit more wider knowledge than I had maybe at that stage and various things. And this is another one. It's not got that sort of sound. This is still a hard rock album and it's still a melodic hard rock album. A little bit more contemporary, but it's not got that 90s sound. He wasn't grunge chasing or anything like that. So if you look for something a little bit different, but connected to that kind of UK melodic rock sound that almost made it massive, as I say, they're a number one album. So they, they were doing certain stuff. Then this is well worth getting on. There are different versions available you don't have to go all in like i have has to be said so toby and the whole truth ignorance is bliss which i don't think i said that's the name of the album i really like that cool a very good singer yes Mr. very Mr. good toby singer. yeah he and is. he produced a whole lot of stuff like saxon and you know a, a lot of up-and-coming bands like the virgin marys he's one of these guys that's been very active in the last kind of five ten years but people don't really know he's doing an awful lot of stuff in the background, you know, producing albums and, and bringing on young talent. He's got a PR agency now, I think, that well, along with Stampede Press. Uh, and, and they're kind of doing a bit of mentoring work in various things. As I say, really interesting guy, very intelligent guy too, as to be if, said. If I remember correctly, when I saw Dio's Disciples mm, five, yes. six, seven years ago, he came yeah. and sang a couple songs on that show. Yes. It was a, a little tiny club, right? You know, yeah. half yeah. hour from my house. And to be fair, he got quite a hard time for that because Dio Disciples were not necessarily well thought of. The thought behind it all and various things. Um, and you don't initially think of a guy who was singing songs like uh, oh, Sex in Cars, okay? And all this sort of stuff is, is going to go and sing Dio classics. He has that voice. He has that. Yeah, I mean, he's not Dio. Nobody else is ever going to be Dio. Right. So I'm not claiming that. But he can sing Dio numbers. He's been in Fast Way with Fast Eddie Clark. He did That's the last, right. I think, Eat Dog Eat, it was called. He's been in Gun, if you remember Gun. Yeah. He was with him for a, an album and an EP. He's one of those guys that he's just had a really steady career doing some really excellent things. I mean, he's, he's played Milton Keynes Bowl. He's supported Bon Jovi. He's done stuff, supported Van Halen. There's a little rumour and a link that he was almost in line to take the job when um, Sammy Hagar left. He, he talks about that in the interview that's on Sea Tranquility. It was a near miss. It was also quite a far miss, if that makes any sense. But he doesn't try away from that either. He's not trying to make himself out to be some sort of superstar. Out yeah. of the two. He's just an interesting guy. And he, he, he's still with Wayward Sons, his current band, still making some really good music. There you go. So check that reissue out. Very cool. All right, my final two of the day here. Uh, let's go to a band that's been around for quite a while that, uh, God, I've reviewed so much of their stuff on the website over the years, a uh, US band called French TV. All right, Stories Without Fingerprints. So this is a, a new two CD set from them. So you got one disc, which is the brand new album. And then the second disc is a live in the studio recording where they basically what they did was they replicated a set that they played live at a Prague festival, I think a year or so ago. And okay. they went back into the studio and said, you know, we're gonna play those same songs we're going to go in the studio and do that all over again because we didn't record the live show. Right. So, and it went over that. Well, pretty cool. So uh, for those of you who don't know anything about French TV, so these guys are basically like an instrumental band that combines like prog rock, prog, uh, prog rock with a uh, Canterbury flair, a little bit of RIO, which is rock in opposition, a little bit of Zappa quirkiness, right? A little bit of jazz fusion. Uh, it's got, you know, you got guitars, uh, bass, keyboards, violin, drums, the whole nine yards. Really challenging music, not for the faint of heart. This is not something you put on and say, oh, I love that toe tapping melody and all that kind of stuff. This is yeah. 
pretty challenging music. Uh, I, I mentioned like the instrumental works of Frank Zappa a lot when I talk about French TV because I think it's very, right. very applicable here. Maybe a little Hatfield in the North and National Health to come from the Canterbury scene. Maybe a little yep. Caravan, a little bit of Soft Machine, that sort of thing. A uh, little Jean-Luc Ponty, you got the violin oh, going on there. A little bit from everywhere then. A little bit from everywhere. And, uh, you know, at some time, some, you know, I've, like I said, I've heard a lot of their albums. Some of their albums are a little bit really musically dense, hard to get into. Okay. Not this one. This Please. is just soaring melodies, I, complex right. little, yeah, really, really good. Right. Well, I don't know much about them. They're a name I know. I'm not aware I've ever heard them. Okay. Yeah, they've been so around forever, bit, but yeah, but they're yeah. kind of like on the underground. They pop up every couple of years and release something, you know, not a lot of promotion. It's like they're one of these bands that if you are kind of into the prog underground, you've no yeah. doubt heard of them, maybe not actually listened to them, yep. uh, but quite good. This just kind of showed up one day and I was like, whoa, a new release from French TV. It's been a couple yeah. of years and I put it on and I was like, holy crap. I mean, this is really good. And the new studio recordings are fabulous. The live in the studio recordings are great as well. So they, they do like a, take a bunch of their older classic songs. Uh, I find that the live in the studio recordings are much beefier from a guitar perspective, whereas right. the new album is, you know, guitar and violin and all the other instruments and what have you, uh, very, very, you know, keyboards and things like that. But really, really good stuff. There's the guys in the band. Should I be starting here then? As someone, because you, you, you've sold me, okay? I'm in. So the fact that you've got a new album here, which is obviously good, and you've got those classic recordings, re-recordings, is this the place to start? Should I? I would. If you've never, yeah, I would. Uh, I, I would think for me, again, I've heard a bunch of their albums. This to me was more immediate, and I, I really enjoy this a lot. And I think it's a little bit more accessible because some of their older music, man, is just so complex and so quirky. It's like, you know, it's not for everybody. Uh, yep. But if you love this sort of thing, this instrumental kind of wackiness, um, mm -hmm. I would recommend it. So uh, again, it's called um, uh, Stories Without Fingerprints. Quite, quite good. I like it a lot. So. Yo, yeah, I'm in. You sold it to me. Cool. Well, hey, we sold one person. That's, that's, uh, that's good. That's cool. it's, it's going on the list of things to buy, which admittedly is a bit that long, but that's... Uh, I know. I, yeah, it's, it's always like that. <laughs> So my last one here for today. So this is uh, mm, somewhat of a reissue, somewhat of like a collection of rarities. Uh, it's by Italian prog band Celeste. Oh, so okay, yeah. This is the band that they released that one album in the seventies that was that has been considered one of the greatest, uh, Absolutely. you know, symphonic, lush, folky yeah. prog masterpieces uh, from Italy back in the early seventies. Mellotron. Yeah galore right acoustic <laughs> guitars and i mean you know it's like, you know like every now and then i get asked by people it's like pete what's like the greatest mellotron album you've ever heard i'm like oh there's been so many of them, you know some of the yeah. early king crimson's moody blues so on and so forth that early celeste album is one of them because man it's just beautiful, beautiful yeah. italian yeah. vocals and somewhat so on and so forth so they released a, a new album like a year or so ago and this is actually a collection of early demos and early recordings that they did before they released that first album. So oh. th while there are some similarities in the songs, they had a female singer for a little while. And right. so you have here, you have some of those, those songs and early recordings with female vocals. Uh, there's almost no Mellotron on the entire album. So at all these recordings uh, were before the band started using a lot of the Mellotron. And some of this is kind of jazzy. Long story short, a cool curiosity piece for fans of the band, but it doesn't really sound like anything else they've ever done. Right. Okay. So I wouldn't, I would only check this out. If you love the band, you've got anything else they've ever done and they have not done a lot. They've only yeah, got like the two official well. albums. Right. So this is more like kind of like a, a companion or curiosity piece uh, of the career kind of shows you where they were early on with some different, yeah. you know, different lineups, different uh, types of instrumentations. Definitely not that big symphonic lush Mellotron acoustic guitar flutes and all that kind of stuff from the, uh, that's you know, interesting the how important that sound became on the debut, isn't it? Because arguably, the whole Italian scene right up to now is still chasing that album to some extent. There's just it's such a signature sound and there's so many Italian bands that yeah. are desperate uh, that sound like Celeste. It's interesting that, uh, that that's not necessarily what they started out trying to achieve. 
Not yeah, strange. I mean, yeah, that's right. Exactly. They, it's like they fell into, and I don't, I don't, I'd have to go look at the dates, but I don't remember whether the first Celeste album came out before or after like the first two uh, PFM albums, right? Which kind of similar blueprint, you know, a lot of the classic keyboards and all the Mellotron, the pastoral thing, so on and so forth. But you know what, as great as like, and those PFM albums are great. The Bonko albums are great. I mean, you got Locanda Della Fate, you got um, yep. uh, Leor May, all these great Italian bands, but none of those albums sound like that Celeste debut. None of them. Yeah. That, that is yeah. like, it's just yeah. like, they it's just almost like, right. That's, it's like, it's like the days of future past from Italy. Yes. Kind yeah. of. Right. Yeah. That's a good, I like, yeah, I, I, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. But, you know, like I said, as a curiosity piece, this is kind of cool. I mean, I'm happy to have it and all that, you know, but it's, uh, it's very, very different from what we know and remember as the band yep. Celeste. So, but, you know, pretty cool as a kind of little curiosity piece. So there you have it. All right, guys. So there you've got uh, eight new releases to check out. Some pretty good stuff here. Uh, pretty sure we have, I think we got reviews of all this on the website, right? Or close to it. I think the, the, Nearly, yeah, is, is, the things I have will be soon. Yep. Okay. So check them all out. If you want to read a little bit more, I know we gave you lots of cool info here, but uh, it's always good to read the in-depth uh, ramblings of a couple of writers like us. Right. So. Uh, <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> like a ramble. <laughs> there you go. So uh, www.seatranquility.org is the place where you can check all that out. Uh, join us on Facebook follow us on Twitter. And of course, uh, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. So thanks to Stephen for coming on today to talk some more sure. new releases. We'll be doing this again, the two of us in a couple of weeks with uh, some more prog, hard rock, metal, whatever we got. Uh, we're uh, you know, more than happy to share. So, uh, and Stephen and I are coming back hopefully next week. Uh, I'm like so backed up with stuff. But Stephen and I are delivering because you've asked for it. Uh, we're going to rank the studio albums of Dokken. That I think is the next one we're doing that's coming up. Uh, and yep, we're also talking with Dokken. Rocking with Dokken and uh, a couple other episodes that we're going to be doing in the upcoming weeks is uh, we're going to rank the studio albums of Arena. Yep. And what's the third one that I'm drawing a blank Alter Bridge. Alter Bridge. That's it. Okay. Alter so, uh, so yeah. that's all coming up from the two of us in the weeks ahead. So you don't want to miss it. And uh, for Stephen Reed, I am Pete Parter. Have a good rest of the day, everybody. And we'll see you real soon.